good. I think the next one would be, what is the current standard, the next question, in first-line therapy for CLL today? And there'll be different subgroups. Let's say I'll ask Tom to take this on, but we're going to talk about how would you be doing, stand what is your standard first-line therapy for elderly patients, for the younger patients lacking 17P deletions, or the symptomatic patients with 17P? Well, of course, in uh, the standard therapies that are approved currently uh, primarily rely on chemoimmunotherapy. That's the combination of a, a drug such as fludarabine and cyclophosphamide with an antibody, rituximab. Uh, there's also the use of bendamustine in combination with rituximab. Uh, and these therapies are the ones that are uh, perhaps approved for use in patients as frontline therapy. Now, I have to say that patients uh, may not tolerate uh, chemotherapy, particularly as we get older, uh, just like our knees and our hips, our bone marrow may wear out and chemotherapy may be rough on the system. So there have been some methods to try and reduce the toxicity of chemoimmunotherapy regimens using drugs that have been around for some years, like chlorambucil, uh, particularly at low doses, but combining it with some of the newer monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we've had now a evolution in anti-CD20 antibodies from rituximab to ofatumumab and now obinutuzumab. And just over the past year, we've had approval of obinutuzumab and chlorambucil, and more recently, ofatumumab and chlorambucil for treatment of patients in frontline setting. Uh, I think that this regimen is re rather easy to take uh, from the standpoint of being an oral drug, chlorambucil, com combined with an antibody. And it's also been seen to be effective in patients who are elderly who have comorbidities. So uh, this is the reason that they have been, I, I believe, approved. Uh, now again, not all patients should get chemotherapy, in my opinion. We talked about the patients with deletions in 17P. In those patients, uh, one may actually make the disease worse, in my opinion, by giving chemotherapy. And we have now an approved agent, which is exciting, the use of abrutinib, which can be used in patients who require therapy. As I mentioned, the finding of 17P- in a patient's leukemia cells is not in itself an indication for therapy. But if they have signs of disease progression or symptoms that we feel are related to their disease, then I think the use of abrutinib in those types of patients uh, is far superior than going through a chemoimmunotherapy regimen. Very good. Any other comments from there? Yeah, I think one of the interesting points that's come out of the long-term follow-up from both you know, the MD Anderson initial chemoimmunotherapy studies and the German CLL study group is it really has changed my practice in that the patients that we would in the past had given less aggressive therapy, you know, so the mutated, the favorable, the favorable karyotype. You know, the suggestion from both those institutions that that, uh, that IGVH mutated you know, 13Q trisomy 12 patient group really gets a lot of benefit out of FCR. You know, and that at 10 years, you know, there's a 65 percent plateau uh, you know, in the progression-free survival curve, really suggesting that you know six months of therapy might benefit that. You know, that low risk group of patients where in the past I might have picked a, a less aggressive regimen. You know, and, you know, whereas you know, the, the higher risk, the IGVH unmutated, the 11 Qs, you know, they progressively relapse. And that's, that's going to be, I think, something that we take into consideration in the future, as we're, particularly for young patients where we're deciding, are you going to be on an oral agent or you know, are you going to do six months of chemoimmunotherapy? And may there be the opportunity of that, even though you're young, that being the only time you're treated. You know, and I, I, say I, use, I use the word cure lightly, but when in most diseases, when you get out to 10 years and there's no evidence of the disease, uh, you know, we start at least considering that, you're, you know, that you're, you've been without your disease for a long time, and the, and the C word begins to be thought of. So, so really, what is I your cut think when, Dr. Bird brings up an excellent yes. point there in that some patients after chemoimmunotherapy can do amazingly well and they can have no evidence of leukemia, even if you look under every nook and cranny of their bone marrow. And these patients are leading high quality lives without any evidence of disease, and 10 years out, they still may do, be doing well. So this is, are they cured? I don't know if we could say the word, but it's quite exciting to think that these patients, with one intervention, have been able to get into a long-lasting remission that leaves them disease-free for many years. But when we you say- You have to the, be cautious, though, with regard to some of those data, because mm -hmm. we, 
we don't really know, you know, certainly when you look at the tail of the curve and we see that tail enriched for the mutated patients who probably would have done well already, but we also have to wonder the number of patients who ran into complications of their FCR, you know, so it's, you know, what percentage of the total patients who should have done well didn't do well because of complications of these. I think that's therapy. correct and you know there are steps to take to mitigate the toxicity of these regimens. Uh, if all you have is a hammer then everything is a nail and if FCR is your only hammer then you hammer patients into the ground. I think that's true. Uh, I believe that patients who are responsive to FCR typically so dramatic re improvement after the first couple of cycles of therapy. So much so that I know that at MD Anderson and other places, they're looking after only three cycles of FCR. And in some cases, if you look at the marrow and look at the patient, you can find that that patient might be approaching a complete response to therapy. So why go forward with more rounds of chemoimmunotherapy if the patient has already achieved a favorable outcome? I think the ability to assess for such things as minimal residual disease after therapy may help guide how much to give and when to stop. And I think that's very important. But I, but I think that's an important question today, especially for, for our audience, is that I'm a little bit troubled when I see patients who only receive, they come to me on a, cons on a consult with Ciela only after receiving four cycles of FCR or four cycles of beta muscling rituxan because they did well. I always feel comfortable that I give them full therapy, even if they have, so nodal disease is gone and the blood counts have normalized. Even if you got a normal bone marrow, does anybody recommend stopping after, say, less than six cycles? Well, I guess it's a matter of opinion. And, you know, CLL is a indolent disease by and large. Uh, and we just don't have the data to say that you have to continue with a full court press like you do it in childhood leukemia and go and just put blinders on in complete therapy. I think that the problem we have is that sometimes the treatment itself can cause problems. And I think Dr. Furman points this out with maybe uh, a marrow that doesn't wish to wake up after therapy, so we have cytopenias, or we may end up in a few patients with myelodysplasia. I think that if we can temper how much therapy to give, and it's clear to me that not all patients require six cycles of FCR. And I think it's very important to note that if a patient doesn't show a dramatic response after the first few cycles, I would say, maybe we should think about something else. Uh, and if they have responded beautifully to even three cycles and you find no evidence of disease in the marrow after that time period, I think stopping and seeing how the patient does actually has a fairly good outcome. But I guess the question, what age? When we discuss this FCR, I typically will prefer using betamustine rituxan in my patient. I'm very comfortable with the toxicity profile. I believe it's less immunosuppressive, that betamustine is less immunosuppressive than a purine analog like fludarabine. I believe I've actually found it much easier to treat my patients. And even though at this meeting there is a, a long-term update saying FCR definitely gives longer, better results with more uh, evidence that in some patients they have uh, uh, a clearing of minimal residual disease, but there's no survival advantage. So my personal opinion is Where's your cutoff? I mean, are you talking about the 50-year-old or 55 or just the healthy patient that's fit? I, I, I don't know, you know. I think it's more the physiologic age rather than physiologic. the chronologic age yes. that determines, yeah. And there are, curr yeah, there are currently uh, two frontline mm -hmm. uh, intergroup studies uh, studying the comparison of immunochemotherapy versus abrutinib-based therapies, and they're using cut off for younger patient, right. cutting off of uh, younger than 70, and for right. older patients, older than 65, there's some overlap there. But That's I don't think there is a defined chronologic age. But looking at the, the data from the BR versus FCR, yes. you know, they did identify that the benefit really was seen in the patients younger than 65 years of age. So I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. You know, it's hard when we're talking about, you know, choosing a different chemotherapy, immunotherapy for a patient, um, what the future holds. But I think that if we are going to give our patients chemo and neurotherapy, we are, it's important that we abide by what the data tells us, which is that the patients who do get FCR compared to BR do better long term. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with that point, you know, you know, Dr. Furman. And, you know, it's amazing how bendamustine sort of found a, a broad audience, you know, really without any published data or very little published data in upfront uh, upfront CLL, and you know in you know the German you know study that compared BR to FCR, there really was not a single genetic group 
that benefited you know, by hazard ratio, um, say with bendamustine rituximab. And so, you know, really, when I'm seeing a patient and I'm talking about giving chemoimmunotherapy that carries the risk of, you know, of MDS, of long-term AML, you know, even if it's low, you know, patients, if they get that, they're going to die of that. And you know, say, knowing that the, at the end of the curve, you know, that there's a chance, you know, that you, they're going to have a long-term remission, because it's not clear with the bendamustine rituximab that, that that same plateau is going to exist. And that's really why, why you're approaching aggressive therapy versus less aggressive therapy. On the risk of being controversial, actually I felt that FCR was superior to BR, mm -hmm. and I believe that that was the case, and I kind of recommended patients go with FCR rather than BR. And then there was the German study comparing BR with FCR, and I'm less sure now, because the German study, uh, they tried to randomize patients for BR versus FCR, and it just happened, the luck of the draw, that the patients who got bendamustine rituximab were older, significantly older, and they had a significantly higher proportion of leukemia cells with unmutated antibody genes. Mm -hmm. Namely, if you took those two groups of patients and you gave them each FCR, the group that got BR would be actually doing worse. And so it's very difficult. When they take out the study and try to stratify for those patients, the results become very difficult to delineate. I was actually surprised by that. So I think that we have to look at the data carefully. And I know that uh, people in German CLL study group may disagree with this, but I do think if we can try to stratify patients as risk, because we know that patients who, have, who are older or patients who have unmutated antibody genes, uh, they tend to have a shorter uh, tolerance for therapy and also a sooner relapse after therapy. It's very important, and I know that there are ongoing studies right now where the investigator can decide whether to give the patient FCR versus BR. And there's a tendency out there, if the younger patient is fitter, we're going to go with the FCR arm, and then the older patients are getting BR. There's going to be an attempt to compare those arms as well, and guess what? We might find a similar outcome, but it may not be an actual outcome that reflects the, uh, the response to these treatments. I would say that if you're comfortable giving bendamustine rituximab, and you have it in your clinical practice, I'd much rather have a physician be comfortable and familiar with what they're doing than have them try to do things that they're not comfortable doing because it's very important to use these drugs wisely and carefully because they do have a downside to them. I think that's a great distinction.